Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Talia. This is, this is, a, it was told that to me that this is going to be a 20 minute long talk, exactly. which is funny because usually I give this same kind of talk in about an hour. So we're going <laughs> to rapidly go through pretty much everything that I have to say about coding. And maybe that'll be good. Maybe it'll be good to sort of compress it into 20 minutes. But this is, this is designing with code as I see it and how, as it impacts my practice. Mm -hmm. And hello. Um, and the first thing that I like to start with is just to sort of put a context to where coding comes into my practice. And first and foremost, I'm a designer. Like all of you, I am a designer and that is what I do and that is what my goal is. Um, coding is nothing more than just my preferred medium. So just to illustrate that idea, um, for some people, for a lot of people, um, their preferred medium is pen and paper. Some people like working with collage because it creates a certain aesthetic. A lot of people like using Illustrator or Figma or digital tools. My preferred medium is simply coding because coding does so many, because coding gives me things that I can do that these other tools do not. Um, and I love coding. Coding is, it, it, it simply just, it makes things wonderful for me. It's, it's my favorite place to work when I work with, with design. I love coding because coding creates new possibilities for design. Now, when we think about, and when we think about this, and this is just kind of to dive straight into just design, um, there's a whole world of new possibilities and what those things can look like. Um, and here's just kind of like a rolling clip, but just to dive in a little bit more. Um, and the way, the way I sort of talk about this too, and the way I think about my work and how I talk to my students about this is that there's sort of three buckets that designers would choose to use coding as their medium. When I ask my students this question, um, the first thing they say is, oh, it gives you a professional advantage. And they're not wrong. Uh, professional advantage is the benefits of knowing the basics of coding as a graphic designer in modern times. If you're working with developers and you know how to code, since we work in a digital world right now, it's a lot easier to have a conversation with the developer if you know how to code. That's a basic. Um, the second bucket is one that I spent, I guess, the first half of my career really absorbed in, and it's this idea of form and function, um, visual outcomes and tools for the design process that differ from standard design methods and outputs. For example, some uh, coding can make design interactive, and suddenly there are these new possibilities that coding can make in form and function. Now, the third category is the one that I'm the most um, involved in right now is this idea of using coding as a design medium for greater reason and impact. It's a conceptual and philosophical imperative for stronger and more meaningful communication design. For example, we do this to connect people. Um, what we're going to do today and what I want to walk you guys through is, oh, um, actually, even before we go to that, so, so this is sort of like why do designers code, my sort of three ways of thinking about it. Um, this last one is sort of, it's basically asking the question, but why? Why would you want to use code to create things interactive and make it look a certain way? Um, but what's nice about this is it also sort of falls on a spectrum um, where it definitely takes a little bit more skill to, to do this last one here, but it also has a larger level of impact in the work that you make, I think. Um, and that's sort of what dictates my work. So to drive this talk, I wanted to focus on the five sort of methods of that coding can impact design in form and in function. And then we'll talk about maybe um, how that can also leave a greater reason and impact. So what design outputs does coding make possible? So the very first one is a very easy one. This is coding can make design interactive. You can have other forms of interactivity if you're not coding. A book is interactive, for example, but it's it's definitely limited in how interactive it can be. When a book, you flip the pages and you get closer to it and you get further away from it. But with coding, it's almost like infinitely interactive. This is one that we see every day. If you're if you own a computer, if you're on the computer, you are you are interacting with design. Um, this is sort of my little icon to indicate that. Um, I love this one. There's so much that you can do with this. Um, when I when I launched my studio, I created a whole series of these graphics to sort of show off the word cotton and the many ways that it can be interactive, as if to say there's a whole world of interactivity out there. There's so many ways that something can be interactive, whether it's 
moving your cursor, whether it's a Tetris game that uses the keyboard to actually control the Tetris game, whether you're putting, uh, throwing fireworks in the sky, whether you're creating sort of like some sort of interactive typeface that changes based on your cursor, whether you're changing colors at random and sort of like creating this really interesting canvas. There's so many ways that, some, that a design can be interactive. Um, and again, I love it. I love it because it's something that's just possible that until we had coding, it wasn't possible for design to be this level of interactive. Um, and here we have just like, again, like a giant bucket of all of these sort of cool effects. Um, but again, we do want to ask the question, but why? Um, just because it's possible, and this is really what drives my practice, just because it's possible, why would we want to do it? Um, and for each of these, I want to show you sort of like an example that introduces, but also an example that kind of goes a little bit deeper. Um, for this particular one, um, I just like using interactivity to make design relatable and to invoke empathy. There's something to be said for if I'm asking the user to play with my design and almost change it and and the design responds to their interactions and their inputs there's something there that it can be yes uh, my design is now relatable to you because i see you and i'm responding to you and the specific the special way that you're interacting with this thing um, an example of an interactive project that I did a long time ago was a, a website and sort of rebrand for a bar here in New York City called Vig Bar. Um, this was the old logo from the old from the 1990s. Very, very old, very weird, ugly logo. And this is pixelated and that's okay because it's an ugly logo anyway. Um, but to sort of lean into the interactivity here, um, the website turned the logo into a giant kind of like interactive experience. And the idea here was that um, at a bar like this, it's been around since the 90s, it's really, really raunchy, um, that people have seen so much and everyone has their own kind of like experience here at this bar. So I wanted this, the interactivity on this website to almost say like, yes, like it doesn't matter who you are and how you interact with this bar, the logo is almost sort of like responding to you in the same way. Um, our second bucket, moving beyond interactivity, and there's a whole world there, and I, I, I would love to dive in more into interactivity, but we have four more to go through. Um, number two is coding can make design generative. And when I think about generative, I actually don't necessarily think about AI as much. AI is an example of that, but at its very simplest fundamental, um, coding can make design generative, which means that it can generate random values. Um, no human can in our head sort of like create a random value. Everything is sort of like bias based on something, right? Um, but in the forces of nature, you roll a dice and that is a true random value. And the computer can generate random values. And from that, we can use those random values to create kind of iterations within the design work that we do. Here's a very, um, very simple example of what generative can do. This was a sketch that I did at the end of last year for, um, for the New York Times. I had a debate article and uh, I did this, uh, this sort of generative illustration. And what the New York Times likes to do is they have these really pretty sort of above the fold landing pages. And with this one, it could have been a video. It could have been just like a looping video, but because it uses code, it's generative, which means that it can use random values, which means that the sort of faces that come here, come in here are kind of like randomly chosen. And then the way that they interact with the other sort of face and emotion and response to the debates is also randomly chosen. And from there, it almost makes the sketch a little bit more engaging because no, there's not a single person who's seeing the exact same thing as the person next to them. You're almost seeing organically how people with different opinions and different backgrounds are debating in live time using emojis and code. Um, and again, it's of such a simple sort of move, but just because it's coded and generative, you sort of get that secondary level of engagement that you wouldn't get otherwise if it was just a static illustration. Um, so that's already almost like answers a question, but why? With generative, um, I like to give this example. This was a, a logo slash a brand that I did for a, um, an arts organization that is meant to give a voice to underrepresented and undiscovered artists. It's called GBA, Guilty by Association. And the whole idea here was that they came to me to design this thing 
I, I, I cannot possibly design for an undiscovered or underrepresented artist, many of whom are minorities. And it's, I, I shouldn't have to represent them through a logo. So in creating this logo, that's kind of like leaning on the signature of these artists, this idea that every single person has their own unique handwriting and their own unique signature. There's something about just saying that the logo is just how the people would write it. Um, and it's random every time and it's generative and there's no two logos that are the same, but that's okay because it's it's embedded within the identity. Um, what I what I loved about this was that in as I was designing this, I realized that because I was using random values and generative design in the creation of this logo, I was able to rely on the computer as a way to almost like rid myself of the design bias. I was sort of letting the computer do the design work. And I, and I was no longer saying that I was representing these artists. I was saying, yes, I'm, I'm not there saying what letter form the G should be or how curved the B should be. That's the computer. Um, and because of that, it's, it's, it's almost like it's ridding me of that. You know, I'm not sort of trying to speak for them in this, in this design. I mean, here's just like a, an output of a bunch of these logos. Number three is adaptive. And when I think about adaptive design, I think about if someone were to give you a wad of clay and the clay has certain properties already. It has a certain thickness. It's a, there's a certain amount of clay that they give you. You can't make the clay grow with the amount of clay that you get. And you are working within the properties, but you can still make it whatever you want. Um, I like adaptive in design because what this is, is like we sort of create Oh, oh, I have sound, having a sound problem. Uh, let's see. Oh, hold on. Can you can you hear right. us? Yes. That sound hear. sound finally came back. Sounds like okay, great. awesome. Yeah, we lost um, you for about the last like twenty seconds. Yeah, no problem. Let me um. Okay, let let's see if that happens again. I think it should be fine. But just in case. Um, so, uh, so what I like about, uh, adaptive design is we, the designers are sort of creating these tools. So we're, we, we have control over the final output. We're saying this clay is going to be gray and we're giving you this amount of clay, but we're still allowing you to control and play within that space. A very basic example is when I was working, um, at Pentagram, we did the brand identity for Central Park, the largest park here in Manhattan, in New York. And we wanted to create this typeface that goes along with it, but um, it's a really hard kind of typeface to, to work with because it's all these small little particles. So to work, th to do this, we created this tool. They could type in whatever word they wanted, and then you could generate the... Um, you could generate the stuff and download the artwork because you now have this tool that you can now make customized. It's adaptive. So we are defining those tools. We're saying there's a certain limitation to what colors they can use and how the letters can be put together. They can't sort of start to move the letters around the page, but it is adaptive. They can sort of make it what it is based on the input. The but why for this, um, here I have an example that um, I did this one recently, and this is I was I was uh, approached by a researcher and she was trying to create sort of like a new form of archiving works. And she said that archiving works are not participatory enough and that there's sort of like a bias to this. So she wanted people to be able to go in to the way that certain objects were archived and then um, add their own voice to it and edit it and mark it up and things like that. Um, so we created this this uh, this platform that we're just about to launch, actually, where people go in and they mark it up and they write their comments and they respond to it and they say what they love and they add their images and they add quotations. And it's sort of like adapting the original thing that they were given within that certain structure. Here's that uh, landing page that we landed on. Here's sort of like the beautiful table of contents that extends that same idea of sort of like the markups. Um, and here's sort of like that final product where they go in and they just kind of like, they go through the text and they could edit it and mark it up as much as they want, which is really nice. Um, we have our fourth category, data-driven. This is one that I have, a, has a special place in my heart for me. Um, 
With data driven, this one's easy. This is, you know, there's a data set. It could be static. It could be moving. It could be always changing. And you're taking those numbers. You're not changing those numbers, but you're letting those numbers define what the design is that you see. Um, think about this, like when you guys have your weather apps on your phone, there isn't a single designer who's there like saying, oh my God, it's raining now. Let me go and cue the rain in, in wherever in New York right now. Um, no one's doing that. It's automated. It's sort of responding to live data. And that's a very simple example, but I love that idea that you can sort of take any data at all and take, put it into some sort of design. Um, two examples here, um, back last year, we were, we did a project where, um, we wanted to be able to show and visualize how many people, um, in all of the states of America, how many people did not have the right to vote yet? Um, and to do that, we wanted to sort of show the word vote kind of like dis, you know, disintegrating into air um, to illustrate this idea. And um, we created a poster that sort of illustrates this, but because it responds to the static data set, this idea that all we had to do was write the algorithm, hit play, and then apply it to the data for all 50 of these states, we're now able to see almost like a pattern with this. We, we're able to see which states don't, which states are doing well, but we're also able to see sort of like the volume of states that are sort of like um, still working on it. So here down here, you see, you're able to really compare the difference between the first one and the last one. Um, the but why for this one, um, this one is, I, I like to make, to use data to make design that remains relevant because if you're always using sort of an evolving data set, one that's always pulling live data, then the design is always going to be sort of like connected or relevant to, to the real world. Um, an example of this that we also did recently was for Earth Day a couple of years ago. We had to make this, this research project that visualized um, the, the plastic in the air around us, the plastic rain. To do this project, we actually had to build our own data set by, by um, diving into all the research papers that are available on this topic. And we had to create this data set that understood where you are in the world, what sort of the environment is, and how that impacts the levels of plastic in the air. But the final visual experience was here was it's it's a beautiful thing. And it, it's, it's just, it, it sucks you in and it, it makes you want to play with it. Um, but what this is doing is here on the side, you see those little toggles that say range, snow, urban, remote, now, and future. And that's based on live data. And the idea here is that because it responds to these real life values, there's something almost relatable about it. There's something um, there's something uh, live about it and current about it. Um, lastly here, uh, just to sort of make this even more relatable, to make the, the, uh, the, the background, the sort of sky where you are, it responds to sort of like the time of day of where you are also. If the sun is just starting to set, you're going to see that reflected in this data visualization. Again, to almost make it feel like, yes, this is also your problem. This is the plastic in the air where you are too, not just somewhere else in the world because it was everywhere. The last one that I want to go into is my least favorite one. <laughs> And this is the one that I'm actually, I'm not gonna show you projects that I did here because this is the one where you actually see the most of this one in the designing with code world around us. You see automated, it's this idea that you basically press a button and you can do the same loop over and over and over again. And um, when I think of sort of what this is, it's like if the, the code is sort of like your cog in your wheel, it's your machine. You tell it to do something and because it has this ability, it can do, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of actions at the same time. Now that power as a designer is immense. It's amazing. And the result is in the last few years of design, we've started to see a lot of design that kind of looks like this. You start to see a lot of design that has particles and lots of pixels and lots of many of one thing. Um, this is everywhere. None of this work is mine, but I just sort of wanted to introduce this sort of concept to you guys as something else that's possible in design through coding because of sort of its inherent qualities is making something automated. Now, these are sort of like the five. These are my, my driving philosophies of why I design with code and what can be possible. And there's so much more here, 
Um, here they are on sort of one page um, to sort of, and, and you can also combine any of these. I think some of these I already sort of had an overlap over them, um, plus any combo. Um, in my personal websites, I do my personal website once a year. And every time I do it, I try to think about what are sort of ways of illustrating my design philosophy in the work that I do. And the thing here, my the, the final thing here is pretty much every single one of those except for data-driven, there's no data in this. Um, but there's something here about it's interactive, you're moving your cursor. It is um, generative because every time you gen you move your cursor over one of these, it almost like creates a random value within these shapes that come up. Um, and there's so much more here. It's kind of adaptive too. It's automated because it's an automated cycle. We see a lot of one thing. Um, and again, there's so, so many more overlaps that you can have. The last thing that I wanted to leave you guys with here is, um, yes, you have these sort of like three reasons why designers code. It's sort of, some of them have more a higher skill, but some of them have a more greater impact as well. Um, but the most important thing to don't forget is that coding is, um, a lot of people do it just because it's fun. I think a lot of us designers, we think sort of logically and there's something really fun and satisfying about the ability to make these kind of things. Um, so so I just wanted to end on that note because the reason that I, I got started in coding was, and these are what I'm about to show you, these are all things that I did in my very first year of when I learned how to code. I made a game where you give a cat a pizza and then I made another game where um, you were sort of trying to get away from all the bad vibes. And then I made another game where using your keyboard, you're sort of trying to get the chicken into my belly and then you lose if you don't get it there. And uh, throughout the, the work that I do on the side, I'm always trying to sort of have fun with it and do these stupid, silly things just to sort of keep it fresh and keep it fun. Um, and, and that's sort of like the last uh, thing that I want to leave with you guys. Um, do it because it has designed an impact, but also because it's super fun. And that's all. How do we do on time? 26 minutes. That was amazing. <laughs> so good. So good. So much fun. All right. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm, I'm here for, for questions for anybody. That, Thank you so much. That, that last stuff is just classic. I love all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Huge, really huge is. fan. Huge fan. So, I mean, there's a lot there. Yeah. yeah and to, are those games online? Are the games online? She was asking. Some of them are, yeah. Um, if you go to my website, you'll find some of them. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into creative coding? When did you start? Um, by accident, I went to design school and we had one coding class. And at first I didn't want to take it. Um, but then, because I said I would just be a designer, but then I liked it. But then what I ended up doing was outside of that class, I just started using it in all of my projects because I really liked it. So um, it, it's just like, I would do it always on the weekends at night, I would do it to make those games. And from there, a lot of it just becomes self-taught. And when you work on real life projects, even if you guys are in school right now, just like start using code, just like go and find some YouTube tutorials and do it to do your projects. And then you'll start to see how it can impact your design career as well. Um, yeah, I, I saw you were talking about pentagram. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of sort of like very powerful design language there for the more or less like classically, you really know how to, I mean, you can have like cats and pizza, but you also, you know, <laughs> the, with the, I guess you called it um, adaptive or we could call it reactive or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, there's this very sort of like um, strong design language that you have. So it looks like you have a lot of at least training experience skills in sort of the more classical design worlds. Is is that where you were, what you were trained in? Yeah, I thank you for bringing that up because that's also, um, that's something that's very true to me also. Um, so many, so many designers who code now and so much coded design is kind of experimental which isn't a bad thing. It's very, um, you go there, you, you make things because they look cool and then you have people interact with them and it's cool and it's beautiful. But I was trained, my background is, I've been working in branding agencies since I graduated college and before that. So a lot of it is 
Um, commercial design, a lot of it is designed for a reason. It's because a company needs a logo or a company needs it to tell their story to their audiences or they need a tool to help their internal staff do something. Um, that's where I love design. I sort of feel like there's a little bit more of a purpose there for me as opposed to just sort of like free form experimentation. And that's why I kind of like to channel my work in that kind of zone. Um, you you have like many projects about uh, climate change and stuff. Like, do you do you change your way of working when you work for those projects? Like, uh, I'll translate. Uh, we'll translate. <laughs> yeah. So the question is about when. There's, let's say, a political or a militant aspect to the work, it, whether it's, you know, whether it's um, uh, a collaboration or not. Um, does that change the way you work? Does that change the way you think of uh, as a designer when you're thinking she was talking about, for example, looks like there's a lot of climate change. You're thinking about climate change. Um, so, yeah. How does that change the way you think as a designer? That's a good that's a really good question. Um I think my answer is probably going to disappoint you. <laughs> I think um, I think my process is always the same for every project. The process is very rooted in understanding the subject, understanding the audience, understanding the client. Um, there's about a four to six to eight week process before we even do the design where we're just understanding the information and talking to people. Um, so for the climate project, that was, yes, our way to do that was we looked at the research papers and we created the data. Um, if we were to do something more political, we would research the topic heavily before we started the design. If it's a logo for a company, we... Oh. 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 You back. We had a, yeah, with a little short audio dropped out at the last like 10 seconds, you know. Oh, hi. Uh, sound. Oh, there, I, we're back. I know it keeps happening. It's it's okay. Um, <laughs> if if uh, so, if it's a logo, then we talk to the company. We understand how they want to communicate their values, and that's how we sort of get into the design. Um, it's 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 easy at a certain point because you get to the sort of like flow of figuring out how to sort of treat every single project as its own project, very new with its own custom needs. Um, but it's also hard because every single project is different. So it's sort of like, a, you're almost like forever learning about different industries and different people and different things because you're always talking to different kinds of people. Thank you. Just your question. That's a great question. The clients for whom you did like logos and stuff, did they want something interactive initially or did you bring it up with? I love that question. That's a great question. Um, I'd say half, half for the majority of my career, it was recently you're seeing a lot more kind of like interactive coding design. Um, but before that clients didn't even know that that was possible. And most clients still don't. So they usually come to you saying, we need something, we need a logo. And we don't even say, okay, great. We'll, we'll give you an interactive logo. We don't say that. We, we present the logo as it is. And if the interactivity solves a purpose, sort of solves a problem, serves a purpose, communicates an idea, then we add that in there and we present it not as an interactive logo. We present it as a logo that solves the idea through the idea of interaction. Um, so, but more and more people are coming to me for things like that. And I think that's just because the world is finally sort of like recognizing that there are certain things that are possible. Jonas? Um, I, I was wondering, I uh, found that you have found like quite a unique style to your creative coding or like not that it's a lot more different from what you usually see on the internet. And I was wondering um, how, what's your process of creating this, that if, if you watch a tutorial that you don't like recreate the style of like really find your own? I think you, I think you answered your own question. Um, <laughs> I think um, 
I, I actually don't look at the world around, like the design world around me. I don't look at tutorials. I don't anymore. I, anymore. Um, I, I don't, I don't do any of that because I try to make the idea original and specific to the thing that I'm designing for. So I, I don't follow many people on Instagram because I don't want to be biased in my visual thing. Um, but, and when it comes to coding, there's a lot of planning. I sort of like design something first. There's a lot of there's a lot of math involved sometimes. I sort of have to make some calculations to sort of like translate it onto the paper. Um, but there's also just kind of like working in live time. I don't know if you use like Illustrator or something and you sort of like to play once you have the pieces there. With coding, it's the same thing. Once you sort of get started there, it's kind of like feeling it, playing with it, seeing how it feels, seeing how people react to it. Um, and that's how it sort of goes along. Um, I guess I'll add to that though. When I first started out, there was a lot of tutorials. It was mostly because I had an idea that I wanted to sort of create. And the tutorials wasn't just so I could learn coding. The tutorials was, they were making something else, but I was using those same ideas to impact the work that I was making or to make my idea come to life. So for all designers, I would always encourage them to start with an idea, start with sketching, and then look for the tutorials that will help them get there. And that's kind of how you're making sure that it's your own original idea, as opposed to some sort of coder developer person who has, who's not even a designer. When you say sketching, you're talking about pen, paper, pen, paper, Figma, Illustrator, head, whatever you're sort of like visualizing in your head, start, start thinking about that. Um, yeah. We're gonna... Okay. Yeah. Just a, a last question then. Um, what, what's your relationship to tools and how has that relationship evolved? The tools could be either the languages or the environments. How you, yeah. Um, tools, other languages. How has that relationship evolved? I'm pretty comfortable in JavaScript and I technology moves really quickly. Um, I, I think it's, it's important to stay relevant, but at the end of the day, you don't need fancy tools. You just need a single programming language that can run algorithms. My favorite one is JavaScript. That's the one that's web-based. It's just, I love it. Um, and every single other programming language is pretty much going to be able to do the exact same thing. Um, tools that help you code are going to help you do the same thing, but in its fundamental and its most sort of like basic, it's just kind of like writing a program. Um, so that that's all the same, and that's all sort of where I where I come back to things like ChatGPT. I like to use that to um, just make my tedious tasks a little faster. ChatGPT is very 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 bad at getting me even half the way of where I the type, sort of design stuff that I do. Um, but it sort of helps me to like get to the 5% so I don't have to like write, you know, the, the tedious lines of code. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. No, oh, great. Great. Well, great. thank you so much, Tyler, for your time today. It was so nice to, um, to meet you thank and you. hear, you know, thank talk you. about your work. So thank you so much.
much. And um, yeah, maybe maybe we'll uh, I don't know catch up soon or meet okay. meet each other soon or something. If I you ever come to Geneva, you. let us know and be happy to see you. Well, you will be the first one I will call. Good luck, everybody, on your um your projects. And if anybody has any questions after this, um. You can always shoot me an email or write to me on Instagram and just say that you were you were at this talk and I'm I'm always happy to answer any more questions. Great. Or thank see you your so work or help you with code. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye, Talia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.